Hey folks, Alan Mandic, Mandic really here. Have you ever wanted to 3D print in a car in traffic? Or do you not have a screw loose? Well, lucky for you, I do. So we're gonna find out in this video how well it works. Let's check it out. Quick warning, do not try this at home. I am a trained professional. I'm not necessarily trained in whatever the heck this is, but I am trained in some stuff. Let's first talk about the why of this situation. This past weekend, we had an art market here in Philadelphia called Krampus Fest. It was put on by a couple of really good friends of mine, and they offered up a booth space to me to demonstrate, put on a display of my can cup designs for folks. My partner, the Ruby Gore and I even designed this new Krampus themed can cup that was gonna be available at the show and available for the holiday season. When we got the booth, we requested one that had access to power so we could have a running 3D printer there at the show. It was both gonna grab people's attention who aren't familiar with 3D printing on a day-to-day -day basis and correlate what it is we do with the objects on display there. Now the problem comes in, what was I gonna print on that printer? The obvious thing would be one of the Krampus cups, but these take somewhere between 20 to 24 hours per cup to print depending on speed, settings, blah, blah, blah. Now I thought I could scale this design down and make it fit within the five hour window of the show from start to finish. But I know from personal experience that larger prints are what really catch people's attention. So instead I decided to go big. We scaled up the Krampus to 150%, turning it into a 42 hour print according to Prusa Slicer's estimate and I started it on Friday night for the Sunday show. That pretty directly rolls us into the equipment we used for this little experiment. My first thought was to use my Ender 5 Plus as it's the only non-bed slinger printer that I own and I felt like that would handle the bumps and rattles down the road the best. However, it's just too damn big. The next logical choice was my Prusa i3, but I'm gonna say it right here right now, I'm not a Prusa fanboy, despite the fact that I've already pre-ordered a Prusa XL. Also, I was running that machine doing production for going to the show, so I would have inventory, so I didn't necessarily wanna take it out of the rotation of that, as whatever machine I did use was not gonna be doing production for two days leading up to the show. That brings us to the machine that I actually chose, the other machine with a mouthful of a name, the Focus Tech Odin 5 F3 Folding FDM 3D Printer. This seemed the logical choice because it's a folding 3D printer, it transports easily. E except I need it running while we're going, so that actually eliminates one of the main reasons why people would want to transport this machine. Okay, real talk about why I chose that machine. It's the only other machine I have that has dual Z-axis lead screws and stepper motors to really hold the X-axis gantry in place. Also, the Y-axis rails are set decently far apart for a stable bed platform, and the X-axis gantry is 40 millimeters wide to really have a nice stable hold on that direct drive extruder. Quick side note, this video is not sponsored by the folks at Focus Tech. I know I'm sounding like I'm listing off all these glowing things about that machine, but I'm just telling you why I chose it for this little mini experiment. That machine was provided to me by the folks at Focus Tech, but again, this is not sponsored by them. And if you're looking to hear some negatives about that machine, get subscribed because I do have some thoughts about it and I will be reviewing it in the near future. With the machine chosen, it was time to figure out how I was actually gonna transport this thing. The most obvious answer would be to just unplug it while it's printing, head over to the show, plug it back in and hope that the power resume function kicks back in like it should and picks up where it left off. Those features can work beautifully when a machine stops what it's doing right where it is and just sits there. But then you have to worry about the bed cooling down and the print releasing from the bed. You have to worry about something moving, whether it be the Z axis wiggling down a little bit because there's no longer power on the stepper motors. The X, Y axis homing properly once they re-pick up where they're starting from again. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in that scenario and I really don't like doing that in a controlled environment, let alone driving down the road. So the in comes the CyberPower 1500 VA UPS battery backup. Now I do run a handful of my 3D printers off of these battery backup units in case I have little power outages while I'm doing small production runs or just prototyping stuff. I don't wanna have a failed print just because the neighborhood had a 15 second blackout. For a while now, I have wondered how long can I run one or multiple printers off of one of these units? If you're interested in the answer to that question, hit the subscribe button because I fully intend on deeper diving into this with different size UPSs, different quantities of printers, and we will be revisiting this in the future. And all of that leads us to, let's do this. We're going vlog style now because, well, this is all just gonna be interesting. We're gonna have to make it do because we've gotta move this thing. And my partner's gonna be the camera person for a second and that's not normally her duty. So let's get to this. 
Unplugging. Can you take this, please? The rock is coming with us. Gonna need moral support. It's who better than the rock? Here we go. Good time for it to be. Okay, that's how we're going. <sighs> okay, this is extremely hard to uh, film and whatever, but we're here in the car. I'm just steadying the machine that doesn't go anywhere on Philadelphia roads, and we are headed to the event space. Philadelphia roads are just perfect for this. Absolutely the best test for this experiment. <laughs> All right, the UPS is currently reading 35 minute time left, 25 minute, 26 minute. And four out of five bars of battery capacity. We have got plenty of time. I'm definitely seeing some print quality issues uh, here, but that's to be expected. So we will uh, we will dissect those as we go forward. Maybe we could build an in-car suspension system for this thing, so like this won't happen. We are arriving at the space now. life left. It's saying we could run for another 300 minutes so the heaters must not really be very active at the moment. Down to 21 minutes. And with that, we made it. Now we actually have to set up the rest of our booth. We did it, we made it. We're all set up and here, people checking out the Krampus Cup printing here live. I'll go back to the studio and we'll talk about the intricacies of this, what happened, because there was some slight issue with it and we'll take a look at it and how much there was when we get back. The event is about half an hour away from being done and the print is not. So if you factor in like maybe a few percent off from the slicer estimate, which was 42 hours, we're currently at 42 hours and 44 minutes, so it's probably more like 44 hour print at this point. So I just dialed up the speed 5% and hopefully that'll pick it up enough to finish before we are done loading up and getting out of here. Okay, now we're actually heading back to the studio and you'll see what happened from there. So it's been a few days now since the show. Let's talk about what happened, how it went, and what issues popped up with actually printing while driving down the road. You can clearly see that this thing did actually successfully finish. It finished about 15, 20 minutes after the end of the show while we were packing up. The only thing you can really see on this print is a clearly defined line right at like the base of the horns, top of the head, where that is where we were transporting it down the road. 
It's not necessarily a layer shift. It kind of looks like it could be, and you can feel it. But if it is a layer shift, it's almost like it shifted one way, then shifted back multiple times. It kind of staggered a few layers and then basically corrected itself and kept on going. In preparation for this, before I ever started this print, I tightened the belts on the Odin 5. I leveled the bed nice and fresh, tightened it down as good as I could to load the springs so they would have a really good solid base to be working off of. I tightened up all of the frame screws that I could reach so everything was good and tight and solid so I wouldn't have any shifting, any movement while we were driving down the road. The only thing that could shift and move was of course the moving components of the machine, which is where the little bit of inconsistency came in here. Honestly, for what it is that we did, and if you are familiar with Philadelphia Roads, I think this did pretty darn well. Now there is a glaring problem at the top of the horns, but that is my fault. That actually wasn't the fault of driving down the road uh, or the return trip or anything like that. When I picked the machine up off of the table as we were packing up, the hot end collided with my hand and skipped steps causing a major layer shift. You can see that one or two shifted layers there, and then I actually corrected it by just grabbing the hot end and holding it in position and forcing it to skip back the other direction. Overall, this was a fun experiment. I did actually pretest a little bit. I still don't know the max capacity of one of those UPSs, but before I started this print, I was running the Odin 5 off of the UPS. I unplugged it and I let it run with a stopwatch running. I got down to one bar of battery life left on the UPS and I called it done there, which was about 36 minutes of runtime at that point. In fact, I don't know exactly how long it took us to get there on the day of the market, but we had still four bars of battery life left on the UPS when we arrived at the show and plugged it in. All right, folks, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this video. It was just a silly, fun little quote unquote experiment I wanted to put on. I needed to transport this thing to demonstrate it at the show. I felt that the bigger print was just gonna be much more interesting to see than even the standard scale version would for folks. So I had to do something to get it there. All right, folks, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please drop it a like. It really helps out. Let me know in the comments, was this pointless? Do you, have you done something like this? Let me know what you're thinking in the comments down below. Get subscribed if you're interested in more maker content, experiments like this, or actually informative ones. Thanks for coming around, folks, and keep on making.